Hello, everybody. Let me start at the beginning. There we go. Even better. So I'm really thrilled to be here. My name is Sylvia Martinez. I'm here to talk about a creative revolution. Now, you may have heard of the maker movement, and you may think, what? That's about technology. But really, I think this really fits in with the theme of what we're talking about today. It's about creativity. And just to share some of my background, I, I love, that, I love that, um, that history. It reminded me of some of the things that, that I went through at school. Um, I have graduated as a, a, with an electrical engineering degree from UCLA. I'm from Los Angeles, still live there. And I went to work in aerospace. Um, after about 10 years, I moved to the video game industry, and I became a programmer and a video game designer because Southern California, and that's what you do. It all makes sense. Um, and what I really started to feel when I was working on educational games is that there was a disconnect. There was a big disconnect between the way schools, and I was back in school once again, the way schools were teaching science and math and the, and the experience that I'd had as, as an engineer and working with, with scientific and science and innovation. Um, and you know, there were a lot of people that I worked with in the game industry, programmers especially, who had been told that they weren't allowed to take advanced science or, or programming in school because they were bad at math. Where bad at math almost always meant they didn't want to do math the teacher's way. And for some of these, these, uh, these people, it came down to a toe-to-toe -to -toe with them and a teacher. I had one of the most brilliant programmers I've ever met um, tell me that he failed out of pre-algebra because his teacher refused to, to credit him because he programmed an Apple II to do his homework for him. <laughs> his contention was that if he had wrote the program, he must understand the algorithms. And she said, no, no, that wouldn't be fair to all the other people who struggled with the worksheet. You know, we laugh, but it ended up with him leaving school. It ended up with him having the time to do exactly what he cared about and become an excellent programmer. And it, those kinds of incidents happened to me over and over again and really made me question why we're so quick to label kids and to define this narrow path of success with science and math and people who aren't walking that path get left behind. People who are creative, people who could be great engineers, people who could solve the problems we face today. Um, so I got more and more into education. Right now I'm working with a group uh, out of Stanford University, the Fabler and Fellows. Um, they, are, they are practitioners all over the globe working in fab labs, digital, doing digital making, 3D printing, laser cutting, working with schools from the slums of Sao Paulo to private schools in, in New York City, all trying to cr create a message of what hands-on learning looks like with new technology. And this maker movement came along at a really interesting time. Now, you may not have heard of the maker movement. You may be completely into it. Your school may have 3D printers and everything. Um, the maker movement is a global revolution that's happening right now. And it's a learning revolution. It's about making things. It's about solving problems. It's about DIY and crafting. It's about owning the solutions to your own problems and then sharing them with others. Not trying to make a million dollars or I'm going to patent this, but saying, I'm going to put this online and share it. And the kids are adept at this language. They understand that the world is out there looking for, for their ideas. And the world doesn't care if you have a, a YouTube video that's got a million hits. The world really doesn't care if you're 14 or, or, or 40. That's the world that they know outside of school. So this maker movement, I think, is actually something that's, that's a, a hint of what's coming next. And I believe it's going to be as big as the Industrial Revolution. And no one remembers the Industrial Revolution, but we know it wasn't just about steam engines. It wasn't just about factories. It changed everything. It changed how and where people lived. It changed how they worked. It changed how they worshiped. It changed how schools were, were, were um, organized. Uh, communism, socialism, democracy all came out of the new way that people live their lives during the last Industrial Revolution. And I truly believe that we're on the cusp of something as momentous that's going to change much more than being able to 3D print some little plastic part. 
The ability to make something that solves your problems, that you don't have to wait for a big company to sell you something, that you can fix your own things, that you can take your life into your own hands, I think is a message that resonates with kids too, who are concerned about the planet, who wonder if the planet's gonna be here when they grow up. And with these tools and technology, you can prototype things quickly, you can make real things, you can make them precisely, and you can make them with, uh, under computer control. And look, I, we could talk about the business opportunities and there's you know, companies that are gonna be 3D printing houses and things like that, but that's not what I'm interested in. I'm interested in using these tools and technologies to help us make schools a place where kids do real things in all subject areas. Now, one of the things that really kind of sparked my interest in the maker movement are maker fairs. And I, I noticed there's a maker fair coming to Wellington, November 4th. These are super interesting. They call them the greatest show and tell on earth. You will find robots, you will find technology, but you'll also find creativity and whimsy and beauty. And when you ask the makers why they do these things, they essentially say, I had to. They burn with a passion to make these things and share them with others. And they almost always said, school just wasn't there for me. I didn't feel the same way about school. And look, that's, that's to be expected. You know, school may not be for everyone. But what really surprised me when I started going to these makers fairs is, is talking to parents. The parents would say, look at my kid. They're building robots, they're programming. I can see they're learning. But every night I drag them away and we cry over worksheets. School's killing my kid's soul. What's wrong? What's wrong with my kid? I liked school. Why can't school be more like Maker Faire? And I don't think that's like a slacker question. That's not people trying to get out of work. I think that's, that's a very important question that we should be asking. Why can't schools be places where students' passions are nurtured in real ways, teaching them the things they need to know to make things that they care about? And I think this can happen. So um, Gary Steger, my partner, and I, um, and Gary's been teaching robotics. He's taught everything from preschool to doctoral level. He's been teaching robotics for over 30 years. He did professional development at the first school in uh, Melbourne, Australia, to have one to a one-to-one -one laptop program. And um, I've been working with schools for 20 years. So this whole maker thing wasn't a new thing for us. We, and a lot of people know, kids learn by being deeply involved in things that they care about. And here is this whole new raft of technology that can help us make more things that they care about and connect it to the science and math we want them to know. So we wrote this book as a bridge between educators and the maker movement, not to tell educators what to do, right? We know what to do. It's just hard to do it. I am in awe of what you've done as a country, and the world is watching because I'm from America and we're going in the exact opposite way. We're taking away agency from teachers. We're loading them up with more assessments and more standards that only serve to say we don't trust you, and we don't believe that you know how to do your job. It's a spiral, it's a downward spiral that's a terrible thing to watch my country go through. We need you to succeed. <laughs> Please succeed. Um, so we wrote this book to help teachers understand how to make the case for making, how to use the tools and equipment, how to connect it to, to, to curriculum. Um, and by the way, everything I talk about is online, inventtolearn.com. There's lots of resources and things that go along with the book. And um, in the last few years, we've also published uh, 10 other books by teachers who were doing this in the classroom. So these teachers write about the things they do in the classroom because I go all over the world and people say, well, no one's doing this. How do I start? What do I do? Well, yes, people are doing it. It's just they're busy doing it. So writing a book is something that's, that takes time. And I feel like it's my job to help teachers tell their stories and to help, school, to help people understand that this is happening all over the world, that schools can change, that they can adopt new technology when there is a consensus, when there is a will to do it. So, I go around to schools, I talk about the top tools of the maker movement. Um, now, not everything, just because it has maker or STEM stamped on the box doesn't mean it's a good thing, right? Some things are too expensive, some things are too dangerous, some things are just toys. 
You don't want to waste your money on something that you, you, know, you play with once. In our book, we talk about three game-changing technologies. Now, these are big buckets of technology. Um, Computer-controlled fabrication, that's 3D printing as a part of that. Physical computing and programming. So I'm going to talk a little bit about each one of those and how it fits into what schools can be, can be doing. Now, fabrication. Um, you've all seen a 3D printer, at least on television. You know you can make things that you design with uh, computer-aided design software. We all absolutely know that the 3D piece that spits out at the end is not the important part of the educational process. The design process, the iterative process of having an idea and making it become real in the world is important. But this is happening in the real world. This is, um, there are food, food manufacturers are using 3D printing to, to create all kinds of, of, of food. You can make machines by actually printing the layers with, you can print the battery inside of a, of, of a mechanical uh, machine. Uh, consumer goods are coming up. This ring I'm wearing was 3D printed. And the medical uses are absolutely miraculous. This little girl, um, has a muscle deficiency where she can't lift her arms on her own. Before this rig was designed for her, it would have taken a, a master technician like weeks to hand make the braces that could help her lift her arms. You can pre 3D print those things overnight for pennies. And you can imagine what happens to a toddler over a month. You can't make something every day for a toddler. Well, yes, you can. Um, they're printing uh, ears out of cow, 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 cow cartilage. I have to say that. Cow cartilage. They're printing hearts and kidneys. They're printing um, all kinds of things that are going to make transplants become a thing of the past. Transplants from other people become a thing of the past. NASA's not only talking about 3D printing pizza for astronauts. They're going to 3D print the little uh, rovers that go out on the surface of the moon or Mars that build bigger versions of themselves. And that's how you colonize planets. The, th the space station has had a 3D printer on board for three years. They don't have to carry a case of wrenches up there. They print what they need. And if they have a Houston, we have a problem moment, they design the exact part that they need to fix their problem. So how does this work for education? I want to show you a quick video from the American Museum of Natural History in New York about how they use 3D printing to teach kids about paleontology. I didn't think that we were gonna go as far as to make dinosaurs with 3D printing. We're literally printing a skeleton. Capturing dinosaurs is the first time the museum has tried to use digital fabrication as a way to teach young people about science, specifically about paleontology. They are being given a group of real fossils Along with these bones, they're being given the tools to be able to create 3D models of them. We got to see where they prep the fossils. We got to see all the places they scan 3D in the museum. We got to see all this really cool stuff that I never even knew they had. To be able to say that you actually held a dinosaur fossil, it was exciting. Part of the program was that we did not tell them the animal that they were scanning. So part of the puzzle was looking at the bones that they were scanning and trying to figure out which dinosaur did it come from? A lot of students thought it was T-Rex. Some thought it came from a long neck sauropod. The youth took literally between five to 6,000 photos, which were then turned into about 150 different models. Every time they were taking a photo, every time they looked at a model, every time they tried to stitch those models together, they were looking with careful detail at minute aspects of those bones. The same thing that paleontologists do. It really taught me how paleontologists reconstruct and study dinosaurs and how they have to deal with disarticulated bones from different individuals and broken bones. I didn't expect to see what we put together to actually come out. It was really precise. The fact that I was able to remake the bone was really exciting and just amazing. It has inspired me to maybe one day even go to college for paleontology. I always thought that I always wanted to work with technology, but now after doing this, I learned that I can do both of them together. But I feel that I can, I can do this. So I can do this. I mean, what more do you want kids to say? You know, the young man who said, um, I learned about disarticulated bones. That wasn't a vocabulary word. 
He learned it because he used it. And that's a horse that sometimes we put that cart before the horse. We give kids vocabulary and then we expect them to stick around for the experience, that they have nothing to connect it to. When we give kids real tools and technology, we can make them the star of a detective story. We can make them understand that paleontologist, did you hear the paleontologist? The job of a paleontologist is to look at things carefully. Who knew? I thought they were like, went out in, in trucks and dug up dusty things. But it turns out that looking carefully, and we don't tell kids about this. Conrad Wolfram, who invented the programming language for Mathematica and Wolfram Alpha, says that in every job, every job title X, there is a new field called computational X that we're not teaching in schools and we're not sharing with kids. Whereas kids who are interested in technology don't understand that that's just not about computers. It's about anything that they might be interested in. So introducing kids to, to, um, ex to experiences where they can be paleontologists or be engineers or be scientists instead of learning about paleontology, learning about scientists, learning about engineering, I think creates opportunities for kids to succeed at something that they never would have expected themselves to succeed at. And schools are doing this. They're using design software to create designs of, say, a wind-powered car, print it out, test it, see what works, print it out again. Uh, laser cutters are allowing kids to cut things and uh, the, the 2D pieces form into 3D pieces. You can score and etch and do all sorts of interesting things like make a gingerbread house. And then, hey, if you've got a gingerbread house, why not wire it up with, with a computer? You can make things for people you care about to help them with their lives. You can make things for people across the world, like this website that connects people who need prosthetics with people who have 3D printers. Or you can ask a question that no one has ever asked before. Like, if an opposable thumb is so great, what if you had two? What could you do? Well, you can not only build that, you can upload the plans and let other people have at it and answer that question, too. And literally, these tools are child's play. This is a, a computer-aided design program called Tinkercad. Look, it's shapes. This is within the range of, of, elementary, school, uh, of elementary kids. And they have ideas. I was at an elementary school and the kids were watching the 3D printer and it was making like a Darth Vader head and the teacher said, well, what do you want to make? And they all said, a Darth Vader head, a, Darth, a green Darth Vader head. And, you know, and one little girl turns around and she says, I would like to make a teddy bear locket with the stomach that opens up and you can put strawberries inside. And all the other kids looked at her and looked at us like, is that allowed? Looked at her and she said, and, and I, I, that's what I'd like to make. And you know what? That's not that hard to make. You could make that. And after she said that, all the other kids started to have crazy ideas. The ones that they thought, that thought they weren't allowed to have. But some brave girl said, I know what I want to make. When you start to use these tools, you can graduate to tools that offer you more professional um, uh, capabilities. And teach you things like 3D math. Now, 3D math isn't on the test. 3D math is hard, right? I mean, who knows about 3D math? Well, 250 million Minecraft users don't think 3D math is hard. They think it's hard fun. And they want it to be hard. They want it to be difficult. If you give kids a video game that's too easy, they don't want it. They want to be challenged. So when you add computation and feedback and control to the ability to make things, you get a whole other dimension, and that's physical computing. So physical computing is anything that connects the real world to the digital world. Ro like robotics, right? Everybody knows about robotics. But it also includes things like wearable technology, from your Fitbit to a pollution-sensing gown. That dress has sensors in it that connect to a microcontroller. Um, that detect the, the chemicals in the air and the program in the microcontroller controls the pattern of the lights. This is a Raspberry Pi. That's the computer. It's $35. This is an Arduino. It's the most popular open source microcontroller in the world. Microcontroller is different than a microcomputer. Microcontroller does simple things really well. If you want to do something like how, how bright is the light, Turn a wheel. If I see the temperature go up, 
then send data back to the computer. These simple if-then commands, you can use these microcontrollers because they're so cheap, you can embed them and make everything smart. There's a, a brand new versions of them. One is called a micro bit. So this is the micro bit. It not only does a lot of the things that our Arduino can do, but on board, it has buttons, a gyroscope, a compass, an accelerometer. On the back, there are LED displays. And anybody ask how much this is? It's $15 US. You have this power that you can put into kids' hands so they can make anything they want. You ripped open his back. What's the matter with you? I had to. He did so much surgery on him. I, I nice. Think. I had to. I love that. Now, this is a completely age-appropriate activity using technology. He's hacked his stuffy. Why? Because he can. Why not? Right? Why not let kids put interactivity into the things that they care about? And they can care about a lot of different things, from toys to uh, plant monitoring to, to um, gloves that read sign language with bend sensors to ballet slippers that track dance movements. And this purple, round purple version of the Arduino is the same as the blue square version of the Arduino. It's just shaped differently with those white tabs that have holes in them so you can sew using conductive thread down to the sensors in the bottom of the shoe. So this is not about saying, well, girls like sewing and boys like robots, so therefore we're, you know, it's, it's not pandering. It's giving on-ramps for all different kinds of kids to make meaning of their world and to control their world. And the Internet of Things is part of this too. If anybody has a car that like texts you when, the, when it needs an oil change, that's the Internet of Things. Anybody seen a dash button? This is from Amazon. So this dash button, this is it. It's not connected to anything. There's just sticky tape on the back. It says Tide laundry detergent. It's what it's meant for is to, for me to stick on my washing machine. When I run out of time, Tide, I push the button. It sends a signal up to the cloud. Tide goes into my shopping cart. And eventually I look at my shopping cart and order Tide. There will be a day where I will go, just order your own washing machine detergent and your printers will, will, will order their own ink and your car will drive itself to go get an oil change or a checkup or whatever. This internet of things is making everything we own smart. Now these are transitional technologies, but it's the perfect time to, to teach kids that they are in charge, that this isn't some creepy big brother thing, that they are in charge, that they can hack these things and make them do what they want, or you can buy a kindergarten product called Little Bits that has a cloud bit where you can program things so that when you push a button, it sends a text message or vice versa. Because what we're trying to do is create citizens of the future. Not just the kids who are going to get good STEM jobs. I'm glad some kids are going to get good STEM jobs. But the point is, is that every citizen needs to understand how to control their own community and use the tools that are available to them um, in any way that they think is necessary. I'm going to show this video. It's a, um, a video from the Making Sense Citizen Science Project in the EU. The dust is coming down. With this technology, we are developing tools that you can use for your need. Uh, breathing um, health, you know, problem like cancer. The cancer? Do you have a lot of people with cancer? Yes. What does it mean? This means people meeting every week in our place basically uh, looking at an issue that they proposed that they had on their neighborhood. And so we are telling, we're teaching them how they can use sensors to monitor the noise, how they can make the sensors, how they can look at the data towards basically creating, using data, using sensors, using technology to create awareness about a local problem that might happen on a city. These kinds of projects are things that kids can participate in. 
A lot of uh, schools are using the UNESCO 17 Goals for a Sustainable World, uh, like this school in Hawaii that has kindergartners to 12th graders working on the problem of invasive species in the stream behind their school. The kindergartners can make nets, the third graders can count fish, the 12th graders can, can uh, collaborate with scientists in, in, a, in the local um, university and solve that problem. Now you might say, it's just one stream. How can people change the world? That's exactly how people change the world. Uh, Paulo Freire said that education means to help kids grasp the consciousness of the possible. Not just explain to them what's happening right now, but to create citizens who see the future and feel competent enough to say, I can be a part of that solution. So the third uh, game changer I'm gonna talk about is programming. Now you've all heard, Everyone should code, everyone needs to learn to code. And it's like, really, do we, everyone need to learn to code? I can tell you that programming is the key to unlocking this, this value of making. Coding works with fabrication, coding works with physical computing. Now, I particularly like languages that were designed to help kids learn, like Scratch. Scratch is a free programming language from MIT. If any of you played with turtle geometry, maybe when, back when you were in school in the 80s, you taught the turtle to like make squares and, and you learn geometry, this is the granddaughter of the logo programming language. This language was designed for kids to learn by identifying, um, by, by block-based programming that's, that's very, it's impossible to make syntactical errors, like I forgot a comma or something like that. When the blocks snack together, the program starts to work. And I have to keep to retaking this screenshot because every week another million kids uploads a Scratch project. Yesterday, it was 39 million Scratch projects that have been uploaded from kids around the world. Um, and the thing that's happening now is all of this is coming together. So Scratch and other programming languages are starting to connect to, the, to robots in the real world. You plug your heartbeat sensor into your USB drive on your computer and all of a sudden your Scratch program can read that heartbeat sensor and make something out of it. So you may have noticed that the three game changers all had to do with technology. Do I think technology is the only way to be, you know, to do modern hands-on project-based learning? No, I do not. I do not think that sewing is old and boring, but sewing with LEDs is, oh my God, fantastic. That would be silly. However, I think we can look at this as a way to just expand our toolkit. If putting on a puppet show is great, why not pay, make the puppets interactive? And I also think that there is a reason to include technology. And Seymour Papert, who invented the logo programming language, said, if you can use technology to make things, you can make a lot more interesting things, and you can learn a lot more by making them. And I'm gonna add that as an educator, as an observer, you can learn a lot more about the thinking of the child by watching them do interesting things. Certainly more than you can learn by watching them take a test. So, you know, don't throw away what works, right? Cardboard, great material, cheap, recyclable, but why not make a cardboard robot? This is the dog. You put him to sleep. It's dark. Wake him up. You can feed him. Get them to see stuff. And otherwise, it's me going. You can adjust his eyes. But if they come in, you can drive him. Tell him to move. So we could do, go through and you know talk about the physical science and the engineering and the feedback and control and the electronics and there's a potentiometer. You know all the things that that you're learning. But you're also making a, a cool, fun robot dog. Um, there are a whole new group of conductive materials that make playing with electronics as easy as, you know, any, it, playing with anything else. You know, we don't just ask kids to write once and say, okay, we're done writing. But in a lot of schools, we give kids like a, a piece of hunk of wood and some nails and, we, and, a, and a battery and a bulb and we wire it up and go, electronics, done. And like, nobody cares and no one remembers and it's not pretty. And, these kinds of conductive materials, uh, those girls are, have painted a piano with conductive paint and built the piano out of, out of small electronics. You can make things with e-textiles and sewable and sewing with conductive thread. You can make uh, circuits with copper tape and small LEDs so you have paper electronics. Um, and I really like projects that span a lot of different areas. Like this is a project in a language called Turtle Art. It's similar to Scratch focuses on 2D geometry. 
Um, and the unit is actually on world cultures. So this is a year four class studying world cultures, learning about the geometry behind Islamic tiling. And then they can use turtle art to make their own Islamic tiling patterns. Now, that's why this project would have ended a couple years ago. You could have printed it out, you could have made a PowerPoint or something like that. But this teacher took it to a CAD program, this is Tinkercad, and he grew those two-dimensional patterns into the third dimension. He extruded them on the z-axis. Now it's a thing that you can print out and hold and pick up and stamp clay. And if you stamp firing clay um, and the kids paint it, you have a classroom set of tiles that arc from world culture through math to geometry to, to, to community, a community piece of art. Now, this is what I think it really means when people talk about STEAM. It's not about decorating math worksheets or singing a song about you know, the, the, the water cycle. It's about really incorporating your own aesthetics into something that you care about. And you know, we, we wonder in school, like, what does STEM mean? Right? Science, technology, engineering, math. We have a class called science. We have a class called math. Technology must be computers. Engineering, well, I'm not really sure what that is. Uh, so maybe it's just like hands-on science, which makes the math teachers really happy because they'd rather not be involved with the whole thing anyway. But I was a skeptic on this, right? When I first heard about STEM, I was like, yeah, right. Acronyms going to help save education. Great. Acronyms have always been the thing that have really moved education forward. Now let's add another letter to it. Brilliant. But you know, I've come around. I really have. Because I think the A means more than just art. I think the art is a stand-in word for, for agency and action. It's the verb. It's the what you do. It's how you tie all these things together. And it's design. Design is so important because the design process, design is the process of engineering. And people don't have to be scared of engineering. People can say, I designed it, I made it. Now, engineering brings in, as you get older, you want to bring in precision and you want to bring in you know, the, 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 the real world constraints that you all have to live with. And in schools, we have a very clear understanding of science and the scientific method. And this is something that kind of trips us up sometimes because we're so clear about the scientific method, we think, well, if we just do sci hands-on science, we're kind of covering this whole STEAM thing. But I'm here to tell you that this is not true, that engineering is not the same as the scientific method, that engineering is a design process and the scientific method is a testing process. Both have their place, but we can't let the scientific method continue to be 99% of science class and engineering being what you do after the real work is done. Um, I truly believe that when we talk about STEAM, it requires beautiful materials, it requires interesting materials, and time, the hardest thing to conjure up in schools. Now, if you think I'm just talking about, about STEAM and STEM, I'm really not. This kind of idea about having kids be a historian is just as powerful in other, in other contexts. Um, this is a teacher I know named Heather Pang. She has her students design a monument at the, at, towards the end of their semester. Pick someone you studied about, design a monument. And this monument has to be to scale, it has to have you know, words on it. Now, she says, the kids don't learn history by laser cutting. But the conversations she has with her students are markedly different than the conversation she had when they were writing reports. The kids ask her, how do you represent a person's life? How is it like literal, is it figurative? Do you have to like cover the thing with, with like paragraphs of text? If Shirley Chisholm, you know, if, if they use doves to represent Shirley Chisholm, is she like an ornithologist or a freedom fighter? What does it mean and how do you convey that? And that's exactly what being a historian really means, not knowing the, the, the date when World War I started. Now, I think we get this in a lot of other areas. We tend to get it more in music, in sports, in art. When we look at, at people playing, we know what this is, right? It's rugby. They're playing rugby. They're playing a game called rugby. But so are they. So it's up to teachers to figure out what's the version of the whole game that kids can play at every age. 
because these kids are playing a version of rugby that's created by caring adults who want to nurture rugby players. They don't sit on, their, on the grass and learn rugby rules for 12 years. It sounds silly, but that's exactly how we're teaching a lot of science and math. Kids don't see the value. And when they say to us, why do I need this? We need to be able to answer. And it can't be you'll need it next year. We need to be able to say why they need it today. So I want to take a, a detour to the real world, because that's where all our, we want our kids to get good jobs. Uh, uh, when I uh, graduated from engineering school, I went on a number of job interviews. And um, one job in particular said to me, we're going to be building something that's never been done before. We're going to be building a machine that can fly in a jet engine or be in a submarine any time of day, any weather, and it will be able to tell where that vehicle is within 10 meter accuracy. This is something that's never been done before, and it's going to change the world. This is like inventing the compass. This will, everything's going to change after we make this. I'm like, there's just a few problems. The math is just a theory. The receivers aren't fast enough. The satellites aren't in the sky yet. The software isn't written, and the hardware we're going to write the software for hasn't been uh, designed yet either. But we're going to do it anyway. Would you like to be on the team? I was like, yeah. Who doesn't want to do something that no one's ever done before? And thank goodness for the blind optimism of youth that think that they could actually contribute to that. I knew nothing. I had no business accepting that invitation, and yet I felt competent and confident that I could do this thing. And, sure, and, and in three years, we did design the first GPS satellite navigation system, and it worked. And I have one on my phone, and the world has changed. And we solved problems that we never expected. We did things that were never written down. We wrote the flow charts after the code was written. We did, you know, all the things that, that real scientists and engineers do. And a lot of times, it was a lot more, more like my dad's auto shop than it was like the math and science I'd gotten in school. And that was the first inkling I had that things could be different. So a couple years after I joined the firm, um, we used the waterfall design method. This has been taught for centuries to engineers. You start at the top, you design, you define, you build something, you test it. You hope to God you haven't made any mistakes because going up the waterfall is hard. It's risky. It costs money. So you're really, really careful that you have everything perfectly designed before you start. Well, they called us back in and said, there's a new game in town. We're doing things differently now. It's called the spiral design model. And now you've, you may have heard of rapid prototyping or iterative design, agile development. There's a lot of different names for it now. But the heart of it is a spir spiraling technique where you start on a small piece of the problem start to solve that, put it out in the world, let people test it and use it, and then see if it's working. And when you get something working, you build on it, and you build on that, and you, you work around this spiral. Now, what happened back then? What kicked this off? What changed engineering that after centuries of using one model, they changed to another? Well, it was affordable computing. Even the, that you could buy, a, for $6,000, you could buy a 10 megabyte computer. For God's sakes, that computer changed the world. It changed the world of engineering, architecture, design, industrial design. Every uh, material science, every kind of scientific or engineering job changed when the computer showed up. What didn't change? School science and school math. We've missed a generation of opportunity to have kids understand the power of the computer because we're, we're stuck, sometimes in the 17th century, in what we teach kids. Now, a computer meant that you could, make, you could take risks without it being in the real world. You could design things. You could simulate things. Mistakes were no longer risky and expensive. You could let your imagination fly. You could make design buildings like this. This is the Frank Gehry Walt Disney Hall in, in my hometown, Los Angeles. Every piece of that building is completely unique. And when you hear Frank Gehry talk, he doesn't say you know, he used the computer to look stuff up or send email. The computer is his design partner. 
He depends on it to do the mathematical work that allows him to be an artist. This is the uh, Melbourne Museum of the Moving Image. There's a load-bearing structure in there somewhere. Thank goodness a computer was involved. And if any of you have been to New York City, you might have gone to the 9-11 Memorial. So these are the inverted fountains in the two footprints of the towers that came down on 9-11. And when they designed these, these uh, fountains, they wanted to put the names of the people who died that day uh, on bronze plaques that were going to be laser cut. The, the names were going to go all the way through these bronze plaques to symbolize the, the emptiness left behind. And they had another idea. They were like, how do we arrange these names in alphabetical order? Because nothing seemed to really resonate. And they had an idea. They said, what if we ask the families who they knew, who their loved one knew that day, who also died that day, and then maybe we can put some of these people together. And they sent out surveys and they said, did your loved one who died know someone who also died in the towers that day? And they got back 10 times as many as they expected. There were mothers and daughters, there were cousins, there were people who, who died next to their, the person who'd been a kindergarten teacher. I mean, amazing, amazing connections. But now, now you've got a problem you have to solve. How are you going to make those connections become real? In addition to the usual engineering things, you can't put a seam down the middle of a name. You know, it has to kind of look spaced out. So they put an ad in the New York Times, and this man uh, answered it. Jur Thorpe, data artist in residence at the New York Times, another job category you may not be thinking about, but is becoming more and more um, available. Um, he solved this problem the way a good data artist does. He used the computer language called processing to develop an algorithm that would help him sort out these, what they called meaningful adjacencies. And he, when you hear, you listen to him talk and he says, it gets like 85, 90% the way there, then he would tweak the algorithm, he'd run it again, he would tweak it and run it again, and finally he just did it by hand. But the design was created with an algorithm by a human thinking about, by humans thinking about what this would mean to people. And so I think about that when people talk about technology. They say, oh, technology is so cold and heartless. Our kids are always staring at their phones, blah, blah, blah. I think it's the exact opposite. I think this new technology opens avenues for the human spirit to soar, to do things that have never been possible before, to make statements and make connections that have never been before possible. So what does it mean for school? That's why we're here. And, you know, you may be like looking at me going, oh, wow, she just said a whole bunch of words and Arduino and, you know, what, what do I do? Maybe I'll just wait till it all blows over. Um, <laughs> that's okay, that's okay. You don't have to do everything at once. Because I get overwhelmed. I mean, I get an email every day, some new thing, some new update, some new, 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 and it's like, oh, my God, what do we do? I can tell you what I do is I think about what I really believe about learning. And does this new thing really fit into my definition of learning? And this is what I believe about learning. I believe learning occurs when a new experience makes connections to existing knowledge, that learning can't be delivered to the learner, and that the best way to ensure understanding inside your head is through active construction of shareable things outside of your head, inside your head, outside your head. Now, I didn't make this up. I didn't invent this. I stole from very smart people. The first two are the Piagetian idea that knowledge is a consequence of experience. The third one is Papert's constructionism. That thing, when you make something in a meaningful context and you're sharing it with others, it cements that learning in your head better than if you were just doing it alone or uh, better if you were just like studying or studying it or watching a video. Now what happens when people don't think about learning is you get headlines like this. Why is Hoboken throwing away all its student laptops? We don't even have to read the article. I can tell you why. You can probably tell me why. Because they went shopping. They were like, we need laptops. Why? Don't ask those questions. We need laptops. Oh, we buy this model. Oh, the teachers don't use them. Well, forget it. That happens in school after school after school. And what I worry about the maker movement is in a couple years, the headline's going to read, why did Hoboken throw away all its 3D printers? Because 3D printing didn't change education. So save your money. 3D printing is not going to change education. It's what the kids do with it. It's the design process. It's building a, a time in the school day for kids to make things that are, that are meaningful to them. 
And look, we could talk a lot about, okay, what to buy and how this fits in a classroom or what kind of classrooms we can design. But again, I go to Seymour Papert, that the role of the teacher is to create the conditions for invention rather than provide ready-made knowledge. And when you start to think about the what do I buy question, to say, what do I buy to make my classroom an invention factory? Things start to get clearer. Um, you want to, to buy and create materials and spaces that provide kids with agency and flexibility and serendipity so they can have a quiet corner or some place where they can make a podcast all in the same room. Have a green screen and a whiteboard and talk to their friends and, and plan something or read a book. Books are really good things. When you're making, when you're putting a makerspace in your school library, do not throw all the books away. I don't know why people do that, it's just crazy. You also want to select the, the kind of technology that has a low threshold and a high ceiling. Low threshold meaning beginners can use it effectively without a lot of instruction, but it provides uh, uh, constant opportunities to upgrade what you can do with it in complexity and precision uh, and, um, and you know, the things you can make. So I showed you the robot dog a minute ago, and you can use that same Hummingbird Robotics Kit to make a robot petting zoo, but you can also use the same Hummingbird Robotics Kit for serious science. You can make genetics machines or waves and motions or graph things on the computer or, uh, uh, you know, use one of the nine different programming languages that it works with. When you buy certain kinds of materials, you get long-lasting value out of it. Now, Hopefully the, the vendors have all gone back to the vendor hall. If you're not, if you're still here, cover your ears. Vendors, cover your ears, okay. Here's my recommendation. Buy less stuff. When you buy less stuff, make it count. Make it so that kids can use it day after day, week after week, month after month. We spend too much time telling kids what to do and saying, okay, kids, today, November is robotics and December is Google Docs and, you know, just January is video. And then we take it away and it's like, well, how are they supposed to get good at these things? How are they supposed to know how to choose things? How are they supposed to, be, be, to understand what craftsmanship is? Because craftsmanship isn't about people telling you what to do. It's understanding your tools and materials and loving your tools and materials. You know, carpenters don't have Hammer Thursday, right? <laughs> you want a simple process where kids get going quickly on the things they're working on so that they have an opportunity to do it again because the best way to learn how to make something is to make it. You know, and look, there's, this is, there's centuries of backup for this. Maria Montessori said, never help a child with a task at which he feels that he can succeed. We're not helping kids by constantly giving them step-by-step -step directions about how to do these things. A little frustration has never killed anybody. A little, right? It's not about being mean to kids or hiding information from them. And Maria Montessori did not say, never help a child with, at a task at which he feels he can succeed unless it takes too long and then tell them how to do it. That's a very different stance. I also think that we can show them things in the world that are beautiful and interesting examples of engineering that not only provide inspiration. Come on, there we go. Not only provide inspiration, but model cultural diversity and awareness of other people and, and what's going on in the world and inclusion. Um, this is a engineer, this is a MIT engineer uh, who does interactive art, um, so she's painted a rice paper painting that when you blow on the painting, the dandelion seeds scatter, there's different things that happen with sound, and when she peels back her painting, you'll see in a minute, underneath uh, is copper tape and LEDs that she designed herself to be flat and work really well on paper, sensors that she designed herself, microcontrollers, to make these pieces of interactive art. And this is a second grade project after watching her. So this is a solar system. You use the paper button to connect the circuit. And when you flip it over, there's copper tape and LEDs. And soon enough, they'll, they'll understand how to use sensors and other things that you can add to the circuit. 
But this is an opportunity to give kids an experience that it's the same reason we take this to hear a Mozart concert or see a Shakespeare play. We want to communicate the beauty and, and the amazing opportunities there are, there are in the world. And there's just as much out there in engineering and science as there, as there are in art and music. Now, we also have to help the parents understand that a little programmable robot is not the same as a little, you know, it looks the same, it's yellow and with black stripes, but this bumblebee that teaches colors, shapes, numbers to six months old is not the same as kids programming their own. That somehow parents get in this trap, and we can tell it's a trap because there's a desperation in e that every toy has to teach color, shapes, and numbers. Are we that desperate? Are we that uncertain that kids aren't natural learners? Why do toy companies have to do this? And we have to be able to be strong and say to parents, you don't have to worry. Your kids will be fine. But we need to give them toy tools and technology where they're the creators, not the recipients of this technology. You know, I just, have this, I just have this thought about like kids showing up the first day of kindergarten and being like, don't even talk to me about color, shapes, and numbers. I've had it up to here. My, my teddy bear, my ball, my, you know, it's like, why are we so desperate about this? Kids are gonna learn their color, shapes, and numbers. You know, we also have a lot of schools where technology is a thing that we do to kids. Digital citizenship is about warnings and you know, what's gonna happen to you if, if you're bad. And this message goes home once a year to parents about the awful things that are gonna happen if your child messes up with technology. Whereas I think we are missing a huge opportunity to, to have students be our allies and our advocates by explaining to them why we care about these things and why it's important as a community, as a school community, as a community, as a city, as a, as a, as a nation, that everybody understands the, the affordances and constraints of, of technology. So if there's one thought I can leave you with is that when you hear people talking about making in the classroom, it's not about buying some expensive thing, it's not about building a new room, it's a stance towards learning. It's a stance where kids, it helps kids feel confident and competent that they can figure it out. And if they can't figure it out, maybe they'll ask the person next to them, or the teacher, or the internet. Because the whole world is probably asking that same question. And look, there's research to back this up. This isn't just hand waving. Oh, look, we've got this shiny new thing. Let's use it in schools. We have research for decades that say that active learning processes are the things that help kids learn. This is a Stanford study uh, in collaboration with the Lemon Center in Brazil. Uh, they studied project-based learning, active learning practices, most significant impact on students than any other variable, even prior student achievement, even background. And number one thing, we know that girls like science because they want to change the world. And in science class, we sort of, we lose them because we lose that thread. We lose the ability for them to do real things that make a difference in their science classes. And these kinds of making activities interest girls in computer science and engineering, which are the lowest enrollment for women of every scientific subject area. You know, finally, universities are starting to help us out too. You know, it used to be it's like, you have to have the best tests, you have to have the highest grades. Well, universities are starting to say, we don't want kids who can only take tests. They're not gonna be the creative individuals that, that we really want in this society. Uh, MIT now has a portfolio on its admissions process. Uh, the Harvard Graduate School Agency by Design Group is studying maker empowerment and uh, trying to understand that, uh, what that has to do with learning, that it's a sensitivity toward the design dimension of objects and systems. And, and look, I'm, I'm happy to be on the same side as Harvard and you know, Maria Montessori and, and Stanford and smart people. That makes me feel good, but it really makes me feel good when I hear kids say it. Kids like Talon. Everything's a lot more simple to make. I can do things really quickly now that I know how to look at stuff. It's a profound statement about mindfulness. Not in the abstract, in an active way 
that he knows how to do things, that he feels confident that he can look at something, that he's connecting his, his head, his heart, and his hands in a way that, that uh, goes across a lot of different aspects of school, not just going to a makerspace and doing one project. And you know, I go to a lot of technology conferences, a lot of educational technology conferences, and people always come up to me and say, oh, you're so right, technology is so engaging, kids love to click on stuff. And I'm like, oh man, you totally missed the message. That is not what I'm saying. Engagement is, isn't something you do to kids. It's not, it's an outcome of kids doing meaningful work. Empowerment is about, it, emp empowered kids come from doing powerful things. Powerful things that you care about, that you can share with a community that cares about you and your ideas, that helps you to trust yourself and in trusting yourself develop a voice. And really this is citizenship. Citizenship is a two-way street. Citizenship is a community that values you, values your ideas, and that you bring, can bring value to. We miss a lot of opportunities when we talk about digital citizenship as just the rules of how to use computers. And I can also tell you that I know this for a fact, you can't have empowered students without emp empowered teachers. And you guys are walking the, the talk in this country. That empowered teachers who are in charge of their own curriculum, in charge of their own classrooms, and, and can make decisions that impact their students in a positive way. So, when we do professional development, we always start with the making. We always start with the doing. What do, with, with teachers, and they're like, oh, this is, why are we wasting time? Can't you just tell us how to like, you know, do maker in my classroom? No, you have to feel what it feels like to learn with something that's unfamiliar. You have to remember that feeling of being a learner again with new materials that you might not feel comfortable with, that you might be scared, you're gonna shock yourself with that battery, but I promise you, you're not. And when you make something, you're gonna feel pride. And that's gonna help us all talk, then talk, about how this happens in real classrooms. And that's where leaders come in. Because this can't happen to one teacher in isolation. This has to happen to teachers together, and they have to have time to talk about what their plans are and how this, this can, we can work together to integrate science, technology, engineering, math with enough time for aesthetics to matter. Because if not, you're that one teacher. That one teacher at the end of the faculty meeting, on a Friday before a long weekend, and you put up your hand and go, is now a good time to talk about how learning really happens? And everyone just like, shut up, shut up, it's time to go home. It's too late. If, there's, if that's the only time you get to really talk about learning. So I would invite you to take a look at our website, perhaps uh, buy Invent to Learn and see what people all over the, the world have been uh, doing in makerspaces and classrooms. Uh, we do run a summer institute. If you'd like to go to East Coast uh, next summer, our summer, uh, we have an awful lot of fun where teachers make things with technology. Everybody makes things. Even people who don't think they can make things, makes things. And um, this is something where teachers turn around and say, like, I was so mad when you told me I had to clean up. And then their friend nudges them and they're going, yeah, that's how the kids feel too. <laughs> oh, yeah. Creating opportunities for teachers to rethink their practice it's not just about technology, but it is about the opportunity to bring new things to the classroom, to learn new things, to uh, create new opportunities for, for students, all kinds of students in all grade levels. And so I invite you, because this is a very unique moment in history, I invite you to seize this moment and to help kids uh, acquire these mindset, this mindset, these tools, and these experiences to make sense, because that's the most important part of making, is making sense of the world and taking charge of their world, because it is their world. And I invite you to please contact me. I'm on Twitter, I'm on email. If you, the easiest thing possible, if you send a completely blank email, you don't even have to write hello, to friend at inventtolearn.com, you'll be added to our email list, and believe me, we don't spam you, we, we aren't that uh, uh, enthusiastic about email either. 
Um, so I thank you very much for your kind attention this afternoon. I'm happy to talk to anybody who would like to hear more about this afterwards or tomorrow morning. Thank you so much.